Hello, I'm Corey Newton, and I'm going to uh, read some key experts of the Global Islamic Resistance Call that are provided in this book. Because the president gave a speech on ISIL this evening, and the uh, Global Islamic Resistance Call was written by this gentleman here, this terrorist, uh, Al-Suri. And he basically wrote a 1,600-page doctrine, manifesto, whatever you want to call it, called the Global Islamic Resistance Call in 2005, which is basically, you know, the jihadi version of the Maneuver Warfare Handbook and the uh, Small Wars Manual. And I think it's important to read. I mean, the president said tonight that ISIS, ISIL, IS, was formerly... Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which is Zarqawi's organization. So what we have over there is Zarqawi's organization going right out of the uh, Global Islamic Resistance Call. So I'm just going to read some of that and just give us a little bit of backstory that I don't feel like I'm getting from the media or any politicians that I've heard speak about it. So we're just going to you know, read for a little while. The Military Theory of the Global Islamic Resistance Call. The military theory of the resistance call is based upon applying two forms of jihad. One, the individual terrorism jihad and secret operational activity of small units totally separated from each other. Two, participation in jihad at the open fronts wherever the necessary preconditions exist. We turn our attention to these facts. The jihad of the individual or cell terrorism using the methods of urban or rural guerrilla warfare is fundamental for exhausting the enemy and causing him to collapse and withdraw, God willing. The open front jihad is fundamental for seizing control over land in order to liberate it and establish Islamic law with the help of God. The individual terrorism jihad and guerrilla warfare conducted by small cells paves the way for the other kind, open front jihad aids and supports it. Without confrontation in the field and seizure of land, however, a state will not emerge for us. And this is the strategic goal for the resistance project. So their goal is a state to have Islamic law and seize the land to do it, which is exactly what they're doing in Iraq and in Syria. Open Front Jihad while it is possible to perform individual jihad anywhere in the Arab and Islamic world, even all over the world, because it is not dependent on certain conditions where it takes place, the open front jihad is dependent on strategic preconditions that are necessary in order to succeed, after success has been granted by God the Almighty and Supreme. Necessary preconditions for success in open front jihad. Geographic preconditions. There are preconditions of the territory. It has to be one, spacious in terms of area, two, varied and with long borders, three, difficult to siege, four, contain partially rough mountainous terrain, forest, or similar, which helps in concentrating enemy troops and in confronting the forces advancing on the ground. It is best to have tree covered mountains. Five, it is also a requirement of the territory that its food and water sources are su sufficient in case of a siege population factors. They include the presence of a large number of inhabitants whose movements are not possible to register, especially if they are spread out in populated rural areas and densely populated cities. In addition, the youth of this area should be known for its military stubbornness, fighting ability, and persistence, and that the fact that sources of weapons are available to them in that area. Political factors. These factors include the presence of a cause in which local inhabitants can believe and in a way that is sufficient for making them fight a jihad for its sake. Also, that cause must be able to mobilize the Islamic nation behind it so that the nation will help this people succeed and fight a jihad with them with their spirit and money and other kinds of support. The most suitable cause among the causes that instigate resistance is foreign aggression and an abundance of religious, political, economic, and social reasons for revolution and jihad. This is called revolutionary climate in books about guerrilla warfare. In our literature, we will term it jihadi climate. According to these requirements, we may benefit from a study of these factors in the three main examples of open front jihad that took place in the past. So he talks about Afghanistan, Chechnya, and Bosnia. 
Then he goes in and identifies a couple of areas where open front jihad, the pre these preconditions exist. Regarding the suitability of the Islamic world's regions for confrontation on open fronts, the most suitable, according to the abundance of factors, if we treat them as regions and not political entities are. Number one, he gives Afghanistan. Number two, the countries in Central Asia and vicinities that lie behind the river. Number three, he lists Yemen and the Arab Peninsula. Number four is Morocco and North Africa. Also, number four he has listed is the Levant and Iraq. Now, the Levant and Iraq, they comprise a whole continuous region with a total area of more than 700,000 kilometers. It has all the preconditions for open fronts, especially the mountainous regions in northern and western Iraq, northern and western Syria, and in most of Lebanon, and also the mountains east and north of the Jordan River. The total number of people in the region also exceeds 60 million. The now emerging American occupation has declared its determination to remain on a long-term basis. Switch that up a little bit. All right, now he describes how to participate in the resistance and open front jihad. In most Arab and Islamic countries, with their current political divisions and entities, the precondition for open fronts are not pre present. In most cases, there are areas suitable for individual terrorism jihad, small units, and secret guerrilla warfare as a result of the dense presence of different American and allied instruments and Western and Zionist hegemonic projects. Those Mujahideen who want to contribute in open front confrontations must head for wherever the fronts open up whenever they open. They must operate under the field leadership's command as long as it fulfills the minimum criteria of a legitimate, excuse me, legitimate banner and legitimate jihad under the slogan of universal Islam. And as long as it is in accordance with the principles of the resistance, is ideology, and jihadi doctrine. When the jihad on one of those fronts leads to victory for the Muslims, that front will be the center of an Islamic emirate, which shall be ruled by God's Sharia. It will be a center and a destination for those around it emigrating to fight jihad in the cause of God. The leadership in the emirate will be for all people of that country. There is a certain inherited social traditions there, and it is of no use violating them or pretending to forget the traces of the past until the Muslim society emerges which is built upon the universalness of Islam and the nationality of Islam. This requires a long time, only God knows. Okay, so we'll, we'll skip ahead a little bit. The relationship between open front jihad and individual terrorism jihad. Some details about this point will be given in the section on organizational theory, but it is possible to summarize some thoughts about the point as follows. 1. Units operating in the field of individual terrorism may benefit from the open fronts in that they enable them to heighten their military skills and improve their training possibilities. It is necessary to apply rigorous security precautions if this is to be done. 2. Some elements working in the field of recruitment and the building of cells can benefit from open fronts by recruiting some of the elements coming to fight jihad, selecting them, and sending them to operate in their countries or wherever they are able to operate in the field of individual or cell terrorism. It is very important to take in consideration that this should not take the shape of a secret organization or a centralized link. 3. The open fronts can provide a way out in a secure haven for those working in the field of individual jihad who are wanted fugitives on the run after having been exposed and are not able to resume their activities in an overt way and are unable to hide. 4. It must be noted that the resistant units operating in the field of secret work must stick to their secret methods in case they are transferred to operate on the fronts and not transform into overt operational activity and agitation. This is a fatal factor and a dangerous slipping point because of the secure and friendly environment. 5. Individuals of the secret resistance cells must, in case they go to the open fronts, work under the leadership of the emirs of those fronts, especially the local ones, or under the general administrations which are set up in case of such traffic. They must work under the front administration with devotion and self-sacrifice as long as they are present there. They should aspire to come to the first battle line and to the training camps in order to perform their religious duty with devotion and to have close contact with the Mujahideen and spread the call and its program in a covert way when possible. Six, 
Open fronts also benefit from the units of individual and cell terrorism because the activity of these units constitutes a long arm that is fighting jihad for the open front's causes. Through their operational activity, they are able to provide the necessary deterrence of the enemy force, they are able to remove the opponent's leadership, operate behind enemy lines, and execute special operations in cooperation with the emirs in those arenas and for those causes in a covert and programmatic way. So they know what they're doing, they're well organized, I lost my place because the thing fell out while I was reading that one, so you just bear with me a minute. But it's very interesting that you, I mean, everything that's going on is, I basically just read. So I'm not the only one reading this, they're reading this, other people have read this. I don't understand why the media doesn't talk about it, why didn't the politicians talk about it? Why can't they identify what's going on there? You know, I think that's uh, troublesome and problematic that they're not identifying what is going on see what I had bookmarked which I lost was about the uh, the will developing the will to fight for the jihad which was uh, if I can locate that quickly to get my bookmark fell out I'll get there, just bear with me. Here we go. Will. The will to fight is a pre prerequisite for preparation and then jihad. All military schools agree that a will to fight and a moral strength of the fighter is the basis for victory and good performance. Also, Will is a basis for all actions and all aspects of human activity. Whoever desires food, drink, marriage, business, travel, or anything else requires a possession of the sincere will to start with. The proof of the sincerity of this will is that he makes the necessary preparations for that decision. In our situation, which is jihad, preparation is a fruit of sincere will. When the will is sincere and the determination is firm, one starts making preparations according to his capabilities in order to terrorize the enemies of God and the Muslims. After the preparation, one is dispatched to the battle. Thus, if the desire is sincere and the preparation is undertaken according to one's ability, the individual moves to launch jihad. Unless disorder and harm we pray to God for his well-being and endurance, and unless he has not been taken control of by Satan or his own inclinations due to cowardice and weakness, a motive by which Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him, described in short. Love for the world and inversion of death. This combat will is the incentive for preparation and activity. If it, it excuse me, if it is very important and a basis for the regular soldier, then it is the fundamental for the guerrilla fighter in general and the jihadi resistance fighter in particular. Even more, it is his basic weapon which moves him to do whichever he is capable, even using civilian weapons if there's nothing else available. So, the President of the United States talked about destroying and degrading ISIL this evening. Now, there's a fine line between destroying the enemy and destroying the enemy's will to fight. Because there is the quantity of force that is necessary to destroy the enemy is known. We know what amount of force we need to destroy their equipment, destroy them, their personnel, destroy, destroy their supply. What is unknown is the quantity of force necessary to destroy the enemy's will to fight. I mean, there's a really fine line between destroying the enemy's will to fight and galvanizing their will to resist. And that is a fine line I didn't hear the president talk about tonight. That's a fine line I don't really hear anybody talk about with respect to military operations, offensive combat, the purpose of which is to destroy the enemy and the enemy's will to fight. And we really need to think about destroying the enemy's will to fight. And we also need to think about getting people in there and infiltrating it and collapsing it from within instead of having to try and destroy it from 30,000 feet where they move everything in a civilian area we're looking to blow up.